and welcome to Access. My guest today for the second week in a row is Arlene Romoff, and Arlene is um, president of the Hearing Loss Association of New Jersey, co-founder of that organization, and advocates for better communication. You're the founder of that, Arlene? Co-founder? Co-founder. Co-founder. And she's an author of Listening Closely, A Journey to Bilateral Hearing, and before that, here again, Back to Life with a Cochlear Implant. And uh, last time we were talking about Arlene's wonderful experiences when her hearing began to come back, her hearing did come back quite, uh, quite quickly, 25 years later when she had an implant in her head which enabled her to interpret the sounds that she was hearing and had been missing for so long. Okay, Arlene, uh, just to review what we talked about in the first program for, for people who didn't get to see it. Sum up quickly what this uh, cochlear implant meant for you in coming back to life, what it meant to you day to day and your aesthetic experiences in life and so forth. Well, as somebody who grew up with normal hearing up until my college years, yeah. And then losing my hearing gradually to the extent that I was left profoundly deaf 25 years later. Excuse it was me. <laughs> absolutely amazing to get a cochlear implant and being returned to the world of sound to actually know that there's a device that could make a deaf person hear again. And we just take for granted all those sounds that are in our lives, but to get them back again with a cochlear implant was an amazing experience. And two, it's, it's more than just the sounds, because sounds are just out there. But hearing is a communic hearing loss is a communications disability. So when people lose hearing, there's an, a wall of isolation that comes up around you that prevents you from communicating with other people. And the isolation is devastating. Solitary confinement it was is what it was like. Have you ever heard of the book Deafness by Richard Wright? Uh, he, he's a South African poet who lost his hearing between the age of six and nine and learned to lip read. He lost almost all his hearing. And he said that the terrible thing about losing hearing wasn't not to hear, but not to overhear. And I kind of know what it means, ah, especially... yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you really, really hit the nail on the head there. Wasn't that a wonderful comment? Yes, because yes. in this second book, which is about bilateral hearing, bilateral, two ears, yeah. I was able to eavesdrop, and that's overhearing. Yeah. That means that you are able to participate in a casual conversation that you are engaged with your surroundings, that you are not isolated, that you don't have to uh, be invited into the communication. You don't have to be invited in to participate in the conversation. You are just there, and you understand, and you're connected. And that's overhearing, overhearing. If you had one ear, that's difficult to do. You need two ears to do that. And I have and if bilateral you have, have no ears, implants. it's impossible. Yeah. yeah people I, don't realize that. And even people with one, uh, one single-sided deafness, they know they're struggling. They don't really know why. And people with one cochlear implant, they, they think they're doing well. They're doing well on uh, word exams, you know, in the soundproof booth. They think they're doing fine. But they're not really quite normal. You need two ears. It allows your brain to coordinate those two ears. We're wired for two ears. And that's what's in this second book, Listening Closely. People don't understand it. I think even some of the professionals don't understand it. When could you ever just take off an ear? You can't do that before. Yeah. I can do yeah. that here. Deaf in one ear now. It's just a very different experience knowing that you have sound not just coming from two sides, but you're being connected. You hear better it, in noise, but you also hear uh, where the sounds are coming from, and you have a sense of being part of your environment. Yeah, yeah, that makes me. Yeah, well, we, we were talking before about um, deniability. Uh, 
you know, th there's this thin line between deafness and hard of hearing. And in deafness, before the implant, it, you had to have a substitute for sound. You had to have lip reading or sign or something like that. Whereas being hard of hearing, the objective was to process the sound, increase the volume, deal with certain pitches and notes so, so it was very easier, very much easier. Now, the people who were deaf tend to be very much in the forefront of advocating for themselves, very open about their deafness. They have the deaf theater. You never heard of a hard of hearing theater. In, in movies and play, things like that, people who are hard of hearing are often the objects of, of jokes. Uh, but we're talking about the, the fact that people who are hard of hearing are said to be in denial, not to want to get hearing aids. I think that's overdone. But tell me how you look at the situation of denial. I think that people with hearing loss do not understand the impact that hearing loss is presenting to them. They don't realize how much they are missing by not hearing. They think, just think about it intellectually, it's invisible. Nobody could tell if you're not hearing. So you, it's easy to deny it. Nobody's going to know how much you're hearing. But I know I'm not hearing. Right. I know I'm faking if I fake. Right. But I've met so many people, they can't really understand why they're upset about it, because it doesn't seem like it should make that much of a difference. And think about it. How are they going to communicate with other people with hearing loss? It's a communications disability. So the person is having stru is struggling with communicating, so he's not about to start talking about it with somebody else. So by, by definition, it's a communications disability, and it's an isolating one. And people generally yeah. tend to think that they're the only person having problems yeah. like this. But we always being hard of hearing, and I'm sure you recall this, and maybe it still happens. We're constantly making decisions. What will we allow ourselves not to understand if there's in a conversation? Will we try to catch up? Will we let's let it go and hope we can tune in later? Will we laugh at a joke we don't understand because everybody else is laughing? It is a constant process of decision, 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 decision. You do it with people you don't know. You do it with people you just met. You do it with people you've been close to all your life. It's, it's this sort of thing. So I find I'm very much aware that I'm not hearing. Uh, and so I don't know about this thing of not. I can understand your point, but I don't know about not being aware. People, I don't think people, we, it's invisible. And I know. It's invisible. Yeah. And even they're so. not getting the information from their medical doctor who was concerned with medical issues. They're not necessarily getting it from an audiologist who's there to assess hearing or a hearing aid dispenser who's there to sell you a hearing aid. Where do you get the, how am I going to function with this? That's where the Hearing Loss Association of America. And in New Jersey, we have the state affiliate. New York has many chapters as well. That's where people first start to learn there are others like them. And I'll have to tell you, when my first book came out, and now my second book came out, when people and you're, read excuse it— And your first book was Here Again, right? and your second book is Listening Closely. Right, Listening yeah. Closely. Yeah. Now, these books are about my experience with cochlear implants, but it's really about my experience not being able to hear, and then being able to hear again. So what the comments I get back, and if you go on uh, the online booksellers, there are reviews there. There are reviews by consumers, people like ourselves, and they read these books, and they say, that's me. I could have written that. She knows exactly what it's like. I can't believe she has experienced exactly what I'm experiencing. And these are not necessarily people who have cochlear implants. They're people with hearing loss. And they said, Arlene, you nailed it. You know exactly what it's like. That's the importance of these books.